What's up, everyone? I'm Dr. Maxfield. I'm Dr. Shah. What are we talking about today? Ooh. Okay, so this is something, actually, this is actually really interesting. So I actually learn a lot from social media. Okay. I do. So I got on social media and what ended up happening was I posted a few videos on TikTok and then from the comments, I sort of learned about different things that people are concerned about that I didn't even realize were widespread issues the way that they are. So people come into our office for all different kinds of concerns, skin cancer concerns, acne concerns, things that you hear kind of commonly, but some of the concerns that people have in their house that they're not as worked up enough to go to a dermatologist, they have questions about these skincare concerns and I just didn't know how common and widespread they were. And so we're gonna be talking about one of those things today. So today we're gonna to be talking about keratosis pilaris. Some people call it chicken skin. Some people call it strawberry skin. Little bumps that you see on the arms, the thighs, sometimes the cheeks, but most commonly in adults and young teenagers, you're gonna see it on the arms and the thighs. They're just little red scaly bumps. So keratosis pilaris is very difficult to treat. Uh, you wouldn't think it just looking at these little benign bumps, but it's just very difficult. So what we're gonna tell you is gonna help. It's gonna help with the redness, the roughness, uh, but it's not just gonna cure it. I'm telling you, I get so many questions about keratosis pilaris. So in this video, we're gonna address those questions. So here we go. Here we go. All right, so in all our videos, we talk about not just how to treat these things and make them better, but what causes this? Because if we can understand what causes it, then we can understand how to treat it. And then you can understand why you need to continue with those treatments and how eventually you will see at least some benefit with these treatments. So what causes keratosis pilaris? All right, so keratosis pilaris, pilaris. <laughs> He's gonna keep saying it different than me all, all video. I don't yeah. know if there's a right way to say some of these things, but. I don't know, it's lost uh, generations ago, I'm sure. What is keratosis? <laughs> Polaris even like translate to. So, uh, I mean, keratosis we know is just probably like excess of that top layer of the skin causing it to thicken up. Polaris usually refers to probably the pilar unit, the hair portion of the skin. So it means just build up of skin in the hair follicle. And that's there exactly that's what, what it is. is. <laughs> It's actually a pretty good name for something. Um, yeah, someone did it right. Uh, almost, yeah. yeah. Now, so what causes it though, it, it's kind of, this is something that we don't have a clear grasp on entirely, but what we do know is that there's some genetic basis, some genetic foundation that's causing abnormal keratinization of the hair follicle. So this hair follicle, like we said, gets this buildup of skin cells on it, and we call it hyperkeratosis. There has been an association with a filaggrin mutation. It's the same thing that is mutated in patients with eczema. So you might see that one person has one and they're more likely to have another. Right, so there's an overlap between eczema or atopic dermatitis and keratosis pilaris. So we often kind of treat them a little bit similar, a little bit different in some ways, um, but there is an overlap between these two conditions. And so it's important to keep that in mind when you're treating this, because if you have eczema, some things may irritate your skin as well uh, that we would be using to treat keratosis pilaris. So we don't really know what causes it. We know there's a genetic component, but what does it look like on pathology? Because we've seen this on pathology when we look at it under the microscope and it looks a very specific way, which really helps me understand how to treat it. Yeah. So you look at it on the skin and it looks like little bumps. And if you look closer, they're overlying hair follicles. So then you move into the path image and this is your skin. And we see just like this buildup of extra skin on top. It's just causing this like little mound, this little um, follicular plug sitting on top of this open hair follicle. And then there's just like a sparse amount of inflammation underneath it. And that can be variable, but basically you have excess skin, hair follicle, inflammation, and that counts for everything that you see clinically. Right, so little keratin building up around the hair follicle, plugging that hair follicle, giving those scaly red bumps that you see on the skin. And they can go from just kind of bland looking and scaly to more red and inflamed and scaly if you get a lot of inflammation around that hair follicle that's being plugged by this keratin. To get rid of this, what we have to do is try to break up some of that keratin that's blocking that hair follicle. But you gotta keep in mind that a lot of these people have an overlap with eczema, so moisturizing is also very important. So when we come up with treatments, we combine these two factors here. We gotta break down keratin, we also gotta moisturize at the same time. And so with that in mind, here come our treatments. So there's three ingredients you wanna look for when you're treating your keratosis pilaris. One, salicylic acid. Two, ammonium lactate. And three, urea. 
Now salicylic acid we know is able to get into that hair follicle, kind of break down keratin. It is an exfoliating agent. It doesn't have moisturizing properties. So salicylic acid needs to be combined with other moisturizing ingredients like ceramides to really get that effect that we want in keratosis pilaris. And lactin or ammonium lactate does have moisturizing properties in and of itself. And so ammonium lactate and a moisturizer can be very effective for treating keratosis pilaris. And then the next one, which I really love is urea at certain concentrations is where it makes a big difference. Yeah, so this is where it kind of actually is gonna behoove you to pay attention to um, <laughs> who view, I guess, whatever. <laughs> this is a long story. I know you guys went to medical school with me in my class. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, anyway, this is one of those ingredients where it's actually going to be beneficial to pay attention to some of the fine details here. Less than 10%, uh, urea actually just works as a moisturizer. Uh, really interestingly, it actually has some humectant properties. And then you cross that threshold and it starts to work as a keratolytic, meaning that it breaks down some of that excess top layer of the skin. So we're looking for urea greater than 10% to really get that effect. So the last thing that's been shown to be effective is topical retinoids. Topical retinoids help to turn skin cells over, but it also helps to flatten out that top layer of the skin called the stratum corneum. So that will help with a lot of that keratin that's building up around the follicle. But it's also been shown to be effective with something that one of all the rest of these ingredients have not been shown to be effective with. Yeah, and that's that, that redness, the erythema, the irritation, inflammation, you know, that's one component of this, that breaking down that top layer of the skin, helping smoothing out just doesn't address. Sometimes topical anti-inflammatories are used. Retinoids can have some help in addressing this. So that's why you need to complement uh, what you're using to treat this condition. Right. So we do have some prescription medications that can give you added benefit, but over the counter, we're kind of focusing on these three main ingredients here. Because the issue with retinoids is that if you don't definitely moisturize before and after applying these, you're going to run into issues with irritation, especially if you're somebody that has eczema or prone to irritation. All right, so you probably could have skipped the whole rest of this video. We're just going to now talk about product recommendations. I'm sure somebody's going to leave in the comments because they always try to sabotage our videos. Uh, they're going to say, skip to six minutes and 36 seconds for product recommendations. <laughs> No, I love you guys. I'm kidding. So, but the whole value of what we have is like the why. That's like, <laughs> that's what most of our life is spent on is understanding why things happen and then basing what we do to target like why it's going on. So if that's not valuable, then we're toast. <laughs> yeah. So I care a lot about the why, but you know, if you want to skip the product recs, that's, that's good too. We'll put some product recommendations in the description too. So you can just skip the whole video and go right to the, right to the description. All right. So, all right. So number one, uh, let's start out with CeraVe SA. CeraVe SA is a, you know, a great emollient. I believe it has lactic acid in it, in addition to salicylic acid in your ceramides. So it's going to help to moisturize and break down some of that keratin. It's not very strong, but it, it does help in a lot of people. Some people say it didn't work for them. Some people do. I think it's about 50-50 in my experience with CeraVe SA. People have had a lot of success with it in my experience. Here's another option. This one is uh, urea-based treatment. It's Eucerin Urea Repair 30% plus. Um, so it breaks that percentage threshold. Uh, it's very effective and it has some really nice ingredients. Uh, it has the urea. It also has lactic acid. It also has ceramides. It, it's just a really well-rounded uh, product. And this is probably higher concentrations that we are gonna see in the CRV SA product. Higher concentrations don't always mean better. Higher concentrations mean increased risk of irritation, but it's probably gonna be a little bit more effective uh, than your CRV SA. So Eucerin Urea Repair Cream gonna be highly effective and we understand why. Next up, the Tried and Trued Amlactin, which is a 12% ammonium lactate lotion. It does smell a little funny, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't know, first of all, everything with lactic acid actually smells a little bit funny. So you'll notice that, but it doesn't, so you get used to it pretty much, but Amlactin does smell a little bit funny, but it is very effective, you know, it, it's helpful for, you know, scaly feet, kind of helps break down that keratin, but also gonna be very effective for your keratosis pilaris. And so those are gonna be our top three product recommendations. You can also use some exfoliating scrubs in the shower. Derma Doctor has a KP scrub that's very effective. Necessaire has an exfoliating body wash as well. They can be effective to kind of help break down that keratin. But like I said, you definitely wanna moisturize within five minutes of getting out of the shower, just like we would say to any eczema patient with these exfoliating emollients. All right, so the last one, you're gonna hear this one here first. This is the CeraVe psoriasis cream. The CeraVe psoriasis cream has salicylic acid, but it also has urea in it as well, and it's at higher concentrations than what you see in your regular CeraVe SA cream. 
So it's like CeraVSA cream on steroids, but it doesn't have any steroids in it, so it's safe for the skin. I would recommend that after you've exhausted some of these other ones, it can be pretty strong. Some people can have a stinging sensation, but I've also noticed that one to be very effective. I just targeted a psoriasis patients because these patients also have very thick scale on their skin as well. So it's gonna work by a very similar mechanism. So CeraVe psoriasis cream. All right, so those are our product recommendations for Keratosis Polaris. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, support the channel in any way that you can. We'll put some product recommendations below. Keratosis pilaris is very difficult to treat, and you wouldn't think of it. Keratosis pilaris is very difficult to treat. Uh, you wouldn't think it looking at it because it just looks like little bumps, but it, it's just so resistant. So what we're going to give you is going to help. Is it going to help? But it won't just cure it. All right, maybe without being out of breath. <laughs> all okay. right. Uh, all right, go ahead. Uh, take a deep breath. He's lifted a curtain, like the it's top unbelievable. of it. With all those muscles, he lifts a curtain and is out of breath. It's, I'm in better shape than he is, quite <laughs> frankly, is what I would say. Uh, I'm ready.